Um, it's a pleasure to be here today for a variety of reasons, one of which is that it's taking place at Cornell in Olin Library. And I want to acknowledge the fact that thanks to Cornell faculty friends, the Cornell University Library staff, and the wonderful holdings of the Cornell U University collections, thanks to them, this book was possible. So I want to start off with this lithograph by Adolfo Hohenstein, a very well-known Art Nouveau uh, artist and, stage, and uh, stage director from the turn of the century, who did such uh, illustrations for many of the famous operas at the turn of the century. In this lithograph, Cho Cho San, who's just slit her throat, discreetly though, and behind a screen, crawls out of the shadows towards her brightly illuminated sun. The image focuses on her reaching towards the blindfolded child who holds an American flag in his hands, his blonde hair prominently illuminated. It reminds us that, through her, Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton has engendered a blonde-haired and blue-eyed son who, thanks to her suicide, will be able to pass as white in America. This transfer of a passing identity, the focus of Butterfly's last aria, went unremarked at the time, except in Japan, where productions often provided Delore with an additional Japanese flag to emphasize his biracial identity. More on this later. First of all, some background. This project began, God help me, some 30 years ago as an opera handbook, but I was quickly sidetracked and it led to a book in three different parts. First of all, on the plot's historical and literary background. Secondly, of course, on the opera itself. And thirdly, on its reception in Japan. So how did this research come about? I got sucked into the historical background by chance. One day over a sushi lunch, my friend and colleague Bob Smith handed me a faded bibliography with an item referring to a talk given in Tokyo in 1930 by Methodist missionary Jenny Long Correll. It contained reminiscences of an event she had witnessed in Nagasaki in the early 19, 1890s. A quote, little tea house girl named Cho San, butterfly, and her child had been abandoned by an American naval officer. Mrs. Correll also recounted the incident to her brother, the author John Luther Long, who immediately began work on the story, Madam Butterfly. Intriguingly, she also corrected it for accuracy. It has a precise time frame and detailed references to the protagonist's career. Olden reference librarian Carolyn Spicer and the interlibrary loan staff soon made it possible for me to compare Long's details about Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton with the careers of, of contemporary naval officers narrowing the small field down to Ensign William B. Franklin, known to family and friends as Benji. Benji Franklin was posted to ships on the Pacific Station in Nagasaki from 1892 to 94, and his career matched details of the fictional character. At this point today, I can add that from correspondence that descendants do quote, do not disagree with my confirmation of a, quote, old family rumor. So Puccini. Puccini collaborated with two librettists, Luigi Illica and Giuseppe Giacosa, with whom he'd already written La Boheme and Tosca. Illica on the right looks rather strange. I need to tell you that what he's doing is hiding a right ear that he mostly lost in, uh, because of a duel. Illica, a flaming liberal, was the most prolific Italian librettist at the turn of the century. Giacosa, a famous dramatist, poet, and public intellectual. The three lived and worked in different cities, meeting occasionally with publisher Giulio Ricordi in Milan. Fortunately, their disparate workplaces made it necessary to send copies of work in progress to each of the collaborators, which resulted in three mostly neglected collections of material, at least when I started working. 
The first was the recording uh, company archives in Milan, which were then overseen by Carlo Clausetti, grandson of Puccini's friend, Carlo Clausetti, who produced the piano vocal scores of his operas. Since his position was literally grandfathered, nobody worried that Carlo couldn't see very well. He let me wander into the stacks to look for stuff. Letters to Ricordi, libretto draft sketches, some unknown and some misshelved. There was also a known but neglected bonus, copies of Ricordi's business correspondence with hundreds of letters to Puccini and his librettists. They've all been digitized, of course, in the meantime. The second source, Luigi Illica's papers in the Piacenza Library, were a more difficult nut to crack. The building was officially closed because of structural problems. But I finagled access after learning that the librarians, take note librarians, still had to work there to receive their salaries. <laughs> Thirdly, Giuseppe Giacosa's grandson welcomed me to the family estate in Coloretto, then sent me to nearby copy shops with some 800 pages of materials and a polite request to return by the end of the afternoon. The third group of materials, Japanese reception materials, came mostly out of the Cornell woodwork. Aaron Cohen, a Cornell alum and Madama Butterfly aficionado in Japan, generously provided materials from his collection and a detailed chronology of the opera's productions. Jennifer Robertson, a Bob Smith PhD, supplied rulerettos for the all-female Takarazuka Review's three butterfly musicals, and another friend, Asian studies lecturer Kyoko Selden, translated Bunraku and Takarazuka libretti. I should also mention, of course, the Wasson Stacks, with their incredible collection of materials relating to all things Japanese, including missionary activities, and thanks to a lovely journal with the name of, a missionary journal with the name of the heathen woman's friend, I managed to find out lots of information about Jenny Carell. In the final sprint, I was also helped, and my hand held, by Kumiko and Dan McKee. So, the initial section of my book is devoted to the history of treaty port relationships in Japan and their literary uh, representations. As soon as Japanese ports were open to Western nations in the 1850s, naval officers, merchants, and even consular officials entered into relationships known as treaty port, monthly, or Japanese marriages, with young women who had been indentured to houses of prostitution by impoverished relatives. Japanese marriage involved registration with local officials, and monthly payment for the rental of the wife, the wife in parenthesis, a servant and house under a contract that was renewable by the month. This practice remained little known outside of Japan until the publication of Pierre Loti's novel, Madame Chrysanthem, in 1888. This semi-autobiographical diary of a French naval officer's marriage with the woman called Okane-san was an immense success. It went through 222 editions in the author's lifetime. The preface's promise of an intimate account of a, quote, not altogether proper relationship, however, is never redeemed in the ensuing pages, but continually displaced by impressions of the sights and sounds of Nagasaki and its surroundings. And the seemingly inert relationship between Loti and Okane is complicated by the presence of a fellow shipmate who shares their mosquito net. This photograph may suggest that she's not sure about all of this. More problematic from a modern perspective, the narrative is also filled with colonialist condescension and racist aversion towards the Japanese. Puccini's librettists would later put derogatory comments by Loti in the mouth of their unsympathetic protagonist, Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton. The next literary representation, John Luther Long's story, Madame Butterfly from 1898, 
has been called a spin-off or even a plagiarism of Loti's novel, since it also begins on a Navy ship approaching Japan, also with a discussion between the hero and a fellow naval officer about trying out a Japanese marriage. Long story, however, is deliberately antagonistic. Pinkerton's shipmate, a doctor, pointedly warns that a Japanese marriage is, quote, not my prescription. The narrative's focus on Pinkerton's whimsical attempt to make Chocho-san into a, as he puts it, American refinement of a Japanese product, presents her as a tragic victim of his colonialist sexual exploitation, alienated from her ethnic roots and imperfectly westernized. So to Puccini, in theory, the genesis of Madame Butterfly involved Ilica drafting a scenario and preliminary libretto, the poet Jocosa revising it, especially the arias, and Puccini setting it to music. This didn't work out in practice, and their collaboration was rent by intense disagreement and temporary breakups. Puccini seems to have been unusually dependent on his librettists for texts to stimulate musical ideas. Here's how Illica described their meetings. Real combats, where entire acts were torn to pieces right then and there, scene upon scene, sacrificed. Ideas repudiated that were beautiful and brilliant the moment before, and so in one minute, the long and difficult labor of months was destroyed. He then talks about the other participants and comes to Puccini. After every session, Puccini had to run to the manicurist to have his fingernails redone. He bit them all the way down to the bone. <clears throat> Fun. So Puccini discovered what he would refer to as the comedy of Madden Butterfly, a one-act play by David Belasco in June 1900 in London. Chocho San's failed acculturation is characterized by a nearly incomprehensible diction. And I'm not gonna try to read this. And I'd be very happy if some, someone could tell me exactly what in the next to the last line, line the word recomlec is supposed to mean. Unfortunately for Puccini, Belasco demanded exorbitant royalties for the rights to this play. <laughs> and the negotiations dragged on for 10 months. In the meantime, the desperate composer asked Illica to, to draft a libretto based on Long's story instead. It had to be translated twice in attempts to, quote, make the author's intentions clear. Illica drafted a libretto for act one that brought the American and then the Japanese principles together for a wedding, as in the finished opera. It was followed by an act that alternated between Butterfly's house and the American consulate. Here's Illica's sketch for the consulate. As you can see, it's pretentious, but empty. Consul Sharpless receives letters addressed to the British American ambassador, addressed as top secret with requests for postage stamps and chrysanthemum seeds. Illica drew special attention to the consulate scene as an opportunity for the comedy of Butterfly's failed acculturation. Note, he said, that one can take advantage of the villa furnished in European style for some small details to embarrass Butterfly. This type of humor reflects a contemporary obsession with the intermingling of different cultures and races, with the thought that the encounter between West and East can be comic because inferior and non-Western races can never successfully assimilate Western modes of behavior, but only imitate them often incorrectly and thus comically. The arrival of Belasco's play precipitated the first of many crises that were to impede the progress in the next two years. As Illica first had to rewrite scenes that Puccini now wanted to be based on Belasco's comedy. The team was further slowed by Jocosa's time-consuming revisions, a quest often put aside because of his other activities, and severe asthma attacks, of which he died in 1906, and, most especially, by Puccini's never-ending requests for further revisions. Puccini was finally able to begin composing in the spring of 1902. 
His search for appropriate Japanese music coincided with kabuki performances in Milan by the Imperial Japanese Theatrical Company featuring actress Sada Yako, who had been a smash hit at the 1900 Paris Universal Exhibition and was now returning for a European tour. Here, Puccini obtained a collection of Japanese popular music, which contained many of the melodies he used in Madama Butterfly. The most important citations in the opera, however, the melody for Butterfly's entrance and first aria and the motif of her father's suicide are taken from a Chinese music box produced for export to the West. This suggests that Puccini was aiming for a more generally exotic or oriental sound, something also true of the libretto, as revealed by his scrawled command on one of Jacosa's drafts, insisting that the poet orientalize the diction. You don't often catch them in the act when they're orientalizing. As many of you know, the premiere of Madame Butterfly at La Scala on February 17th resulted in one of the most notorious failures in the history of opera. The performance was constantly interrupted by kibitzing and catcalls from the gallery, and it ended up in glacial silence. The opera was withdrawn the next day and quickly revised for a second performance in Brescia, uh, at Brescia in May, and it was a triumphant success. It was revised twice more for American and French premieres in 1906, at which point economic necessity forced Ricordi to produce a temporary orchestral score. It was never replaced. Puccini continued to add, delete, and reinstate deletions, uh, deletions almost until his death. As a result, Madame Butterfly remains a set of options rather than an opera, as you'll soon see. So to the opera itself, uh, Madame Butterfly, of course, is the central focus of the book. Because of copyright restrictions, I'm not allowed to illustrate this recorded chat with copyrighted musical recordings. And I guarantee that you don't want to hear me sing. Somebody's heard me sing. I'll try to discuss the initial arias of Pinkerton and Butterfly, commenting on the music as a way of suggesting how the music frames the tragedy. Pinkerton's introductory aria is a jaunty allegro surrounded by citations of the Star Spangled Banner, set for a combination of winds and brass reminiscent of a military band. The anthem frames Pinkerton's extension of American gunboat diplomacy into a private life of sexual tourism, introducing a Yankee vagabond's reckless pursuit of pleasure throughout the world discussed in a boozy way with the American Council Sharpless. Brushing, brushing aside Sharpless's objections about this facile gospel, Pinkerton repeats the initial melodic phrase, placing his faith in American talent to succeed in every region with every beauty, a rather disturbing generality for a wedding day. But then he switches abruptly in a spectacular non sequitur, clarifying the relationship between the Yankee vagabond's search for pleasure and his own behavior, he jauntily displaces his description, his, his deception, sorry, of butterfly to the Japanese custom of temporary marriage. I can escape every month. Butterfly is ignorant of this, of course. as are many audiences. In early versions of the opera, Sharpless warns Pinkerton about the danger of his deception. However, Puccini did not set the warning about the pseudo wedding to music, and the remainder gets lost amidst a chorus of Butterfly's relatives. To confuse matters, Pinkerton has also arranged a public ceremony at his residence which seems to follow a Japanese marriage custom involving a procession of the bride and her party to the husband's home to celebrate her change of status. And inasmuch as Sharpless appears to have helped arrange the wedding 
and withdraws with Japanese officials to prepare the quote unquote marriage contract, his presence gives the ceremony an aura of official sanction. And Butterfly believes it. A conversation with Sharpless on her arrival has already revealed details about her background, her name and age, 15, the suicide of her samurai father, and the impoverishment of her family that have forced her to become a geisha, that is, in this case, a temporary wife. In the meantime, though, she's fallen in love with Pinkerton. Alone with him, the moments, moments before the wedding, she envisions her future as his wife in the aria, Io seguo il mio destino. The complex and conflicted nature of her characterization led Puccini and his team to numerous changes during the initial history of the opera. Don't freak out, please. This is a synoptic rendition of her aria. The first passage in, in uh, brackets, you spent 100 yen for me, was deleted for the 1906 French performance. The statement, it is my destiny, was deleted for the second performance. In the same church on my knees with you, wasn't orchestrated until 1906. And um, finally, the passage ends in green asterisks, a very important one, uh, was deleted after the second performance at Brescia. In this aria, Puccini emphasizes Cho Cho San's proposed identity formation with the melody associated with her entrance. However, as Butterfly acts on the decision to reject her Japanese ethnicity, early scores indicate that she should, quote, break off her high A for fear of being heard by her relatives, while the music slips suddenly from A major to A minor and the motif of her father's suicide bursts forth fortissimo, making the heroine pause before hiding the statues of her ancestors. You miss a lot if you don't read or perform the early versions of the score. And I know of no soprano willing to break off that high note to underscore this moment. Butterfly's truncated aria about her desired identity and its interruption by the motif of her father's suicide vividly exemplify the opera's implicit opposition between East and West, also suggesting that this conflict is being fought within Cho Cho San herself. The suicide motif implies here that the heroine's essential nature as a Japanese woman, dominated by forces of patriarchy and religion, will interfere with, indeed prevent, her coveted identity as an American wife. In spite of the desire to cast off her native ethnicity and construct a new existence as Mrs. Pinkerton, Butterfly seems destined to remain inescapably her father's daughter and inescapably Japanese. Act two of the opera traces the consequences of Pinkerton's deception, focusing on Butterfly's delusion. And this is where the disparate but complementary contributions of Ilica and Chikosa come into play. Their dialogic construction of Cho Cho San's dilemma is both sadistic and empathetic. To start with Ilica. Ilica followed Velasco's comedy in endowing her with an infantilizing Japanese identity. She welcomes Sharpless to her American house but he's forced to sit down grotesquely on a cushion because there are no chairs. She offers him a pipe to smoke, identified in early versions as an opium pipe. She wonders whether robins nest only every three years in America and stumbles over the word ornithology. She argues the validity of her marriage in an imaginary American divorce court. Jacosa, who was noted for his psychologically intense dramas, added to this the emotional interiority necessary for an operatic heroine with the arias Un Bel Di, Que Tu Madre, and the final suicide scene, which Ilica had largely left wordless. As a result, 
Puccini's orientalizing comedy of Cho Cho San's failed acculturation as Madama Pinkerton coexists with the intense emotion of Arya's performing her delusion, subsequent disillusion, and death. So the third part of the book is devoted to the Japanese reception of Madama Butterfly. First, I need to take a swig of water. Let me introduce the first Japanese person to become acquainted with Puccini's opera. Hisako Oyama, wife of the Japanese ambassador to Italy, played Japanese music for, Je for Puccini in the late summer of 1902. A letter by the composer describes her as a, quote, very intelligent and sympathetically ugly person who played, quote, native songs for him. A Japanese, uh, a Japanese description would have probably been somewhat different. Baroness Hisako Oyama was a gifted musician, proficient in singing Naga Uta as well as playing the koto, that is to say, a repertoire very different from simple native songs. As an official representative of a modern westernized Japan, she didn't hesitate to criticize the orientalizing representation of the opera. Puccini's letter mentions her objections to inappropriate Japanese names, including the garbled deities in Suzuki's prayer at the beginning of Act Two. Corrections in green. The prayer itself, though, also contains more embarrassing mistakes. Butterfly kneels in front of a Buddha, but she prays to Shinto divinities. Puccini also set this prayer to Takayama, a native song about viewing blossoming cucumbers and eggplants from a high mountain. And he slowed the tempo down drastically to imply that the repetitious alien ritual gives Suzuki a headache. You can, uh, Puccini, of course, ignored Hisako Oyama's suggestions. Her grandson, Paul Sawada, who by the way received a Cornell MA in 1952, informed me that Puccini's use of vulgar songs explains why she refused to attend the premiere of Madama Butterfly at La Scala. As an orientalizing tragedy with a racially biased representation of the heroine, Madama Butterfly became a lightning rod for issues of sovereignty and identity politics in Japan, generating deorientalizing productions that recuperated the heroine as an exemplar of pure-hearted Japanese womanhood, while also stimulating transpositions into indigenous theater traditions. The first of two final chapters in the book uh, discusses productions of the opera. I'll just mention a partial preliminary version of the, of the opera, which took place at the Imperial Theater in Tokyo in January 1914, featuring Sumiko Takaori and her husband Shuichi, who were recently returned <coughs> from the United States. What I want to do, though, is to discuss possibly the most important early production of Madama Butterfly. In 1930, the distinguished Japanese composer Kosaku Yamada and director Keizo Horiyuchi organized a nationally publicized, corrected version of the opera, designed to be acceptable to Japanese audiences and featuring Japanese singers for Japanese characters and Western singers for the American characters. The production eliminated unrealistic elements, including most of the entire wedding scene, which was considered, quote, too hilarious and painful for a Japanese to watch. In act two, the denuding of the garden for the flower duet between Suzuki and Butterfly was replaced by their simply making a flower arrangement. And Butterfly's, quote, idiotic poking of three holes in a screen to begin her vigil was replaced by having her simply open a window to look out over the harbor. Since Madama Butterfly was a representation of the Japanese nation, Yamada and Horiyuchi took considerable pains to disguise the opera's background in treaty port prostitution. 
Cho Cho San became 21 years old instead of 15, a more realistic age for a real geisha. Goro, instead of being a, quote, exceedingly unpleasant pimp, became a, quote, intelligent translator. And all references to payment for Cho Cho San were eliminated. The wedding ceremony was reduced to having Goro simply inform Pinkerton that the guests, quote, will greet you and say words of blessing, implying that they're already legitimately married. The replacement of a contractual relationship with Pinkerton by a pre-existing love interest had important consequences for the heroine's characterization, as the opera's hints of delusional belief in her marriage disappeared. One could say that the production transposed Puccini's orientalizing tragedy into a domestic conflict fraught by cultural difference. This disparity climaxed in the Act One love duet, which recast the exchanges of Pinkerton and Ocho as a series of separate interior monologues in English and Japanese. The disparity was heightened by the fact that the tenor didn't know English, so he was allowed to sing in German. This attempt, this attempt at cultural verisimilitude, however, also broached some interesting problems of historicity. Although Puccini's score locates the action in the present day, that is 1904, playbills place the time of the action at about 1885, the, the year Pierre Loti was stationed at Nagasaki. And a stagehands essay reveals that the production team decided to por portray a time about 1887, the publication year of Madame Chrysanthème. In essence, this suggests that the Japanese production was also an implicit palimpsest or override or erasure of the Western narrative of treaty port marriage introduced by Pierre Loti and John Luther Long. My final chapter, on transpositions of Madama Butterfly into Japanese theater genres focuses on three publications, three productions. A 1931 all-female Takarazuka review, a concise Madama Butterfly, which updated the tragedy to the xenophobic atmosphere of Showa cultural politics. Then a 1956 Bunraku puppet play replaced Puccini's orchestra by uh, by the traditional bunraku shamisen accompaniment. And it recuperated Butterfly in the tradition of a classical Japanese lover's tragedy. She is an uncompromising figure of tragic stature pursuing a dream of deluded passion. I want to conclude with a more detailed description of the third adaptation, a 1953 Takarazu, Takarazuka uh, musical, Three Generation Chocho San. Chocho San San Daiki. The action is pointedly heterochronic, alternating between the Nagasaki of the opera and the present, and interlacing the tragedies of Chocho San and the atomic bomb with a sophisticated use of scenes on stage and before the curtain, and music from time periods spanning more than half a century. It opens in post Abam Nagasaki where an elderly woman named Kiyo is sweeping leaves under a cherry tree in full bloom. Michi, a young Japanese-American tourist, has come to see where her grandmother lived. Spoiler alert, their grandmother and granddaughter. Kiyo tells Michi a story of long ago. A series of flashbacks introduce us to Joy the adult son of Butterfly and Pinkerton, <clears throat> who sails to Nagasaki as, yes, a US Navy officer seeking to recover his Japanese heritage. Joy meets Kiyo and they fall in love, promising not to be like Pinkerton and Chocho san In order to rescue Kiyo from becoming the concubine of a Chinese businessman, they attempt to flee to Tokyo but are separated by nationalists celebrating Japan's victory over Russia in 1905. But Joy manages to return 12 years later, looking for Kiyo, 
and he encounters a Eurasian girl named Mio who's being bullied as a half-breed. And this enables him to recognize his daughter and be reunited with Keo. But Joey is called to duty in World War I and, and wounded in action. He hobbles back to Japan in 1923, where the lovers are reunited, but again separated by the great Kanto earthquake. Joey manages to escape back to the United States with his daughter, where she becomes the mother of Michi, the young tourist in the opening scene. Michi identifies herself to Kiyo as Joey comes on the scene, and she reunites her grandparents. They drop their canes and limp haltingly towards each other in tears. The cherry trees are still in full blossom. That's it. I'm delighted to report that two younger friends and colleagues, Naomi Matsumoto of the University of London and Kuni Ohara of the University of South Carolina, are currently engaged in monographs about the large repertory of Japanese and Japanese-American productions and adaptations of Madama Butterfly, an opera, it seems, that really never will be finished. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Art. And uh, we have some time for questions, both uh, from the audience here in the room and also online. Um, Um, Art, I thank you so much. I really enjoyed your your talk. Um, I enjoyed your help. <laughs> <laughs> Could you um, give us some more details about Japanese sources, uh, musical sources for the opera? I mean, which what types of pieces? What what was vulgar about them? Um, how those played into the the sort of I'll say the kind of Western view of the of the opera versus the Japanese ideas about it, or at least about the story. Um, he was um, he was desperate to find some Japanese music in order to give the orchestration a, an exotic uh, an exotic sound, and he would complain for several months about the fact that he couldn't find any stuff that was any good or very interesting, because at that time uh, this this would have been 1902 there were very few European publications of Japanese music. Um, uh, Sato Yako had uh, performed in, in, 19, in 1900, and in fact, uh, some of her repertoire had been recorded on cylinders in, in Berlin uh, in, in that year. And Puccini heard her. Uh, in addition, um, a, a woman did a a little booklet for the Paris exhibition on the exotic music at the Paris exhibition. And she also talked about Sada Yako and uh, included a transcription of the famous, uh, the famous mel mel melody Ichigo Jishi. Uh, and um, Puccini heard her, she, she, she actually sang that in a, a, a kabuki performance that Puccini attended. Uh, in in May of 1902, uh, the the uh, cylinder recording of her singing Exigo uh is excellent. So one that can actually prepare compare what Puccini said with what what she sang. But the interesting thing is that he didn't transcribe what she had sung. He simply he used the melody from that book of Japanese popular melodies that he apparently obtained at the performance of Sadayako. Do, do you know what sort of tradition Sadayako came from? I mean, it wouldn't have been kabuki because that's all um, male. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just curious. Um, I, I, it's been extensively written about. Uh, I, I'm not really competent to talk about how to put it, uh, bonderized adaptations of kabuki drama. I mean, one reason being that they performed in Japanese, so of course no European audiences could understand them. 
So what they had to do was to drastically reduce these dramas to basically violent actions, mm -hmm. which always culminated in suicide scenes, which really, which really just fascinated European audiences. They just kept raving about that. So, I mean, obviously Puccini's opera had to end with, uh, with the suicide scene. And one of the interesting things about that is that uh, in the early version of Madama Butterfly, Puccini had a whole act set at the uh, American consulate and he eliminated it uh, because he wanted the action to move more efficaciously and quickly to the, final, to the final suicide. And the words that he uses to describe the reason he wants this to be efficient and quick are almost exact quotations of newspaper reviews of Sadayako's suicides. I didn't really answer your question, but I got in some more details. <laughs> yes. Okay. The, the, the version that you would see at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, would probably be the 1907 temporary orchestral score. Um, one of the things that's, uh, that, that's by far the most common version performed. Uh, one of the interesting things though is that recently uh, there have been attempts to, public, to, to produce both the catastrophic La Scala version and the Brescia revised version. Um, the, um, the problem here is that people don't really quite know what the score is, if you pardon the expression, um, because uh, the La Scala score was published months in advance of the actual performance because the singers and the orchestra had to have something to rehearse from. So we don't really know what was actually performed. Uh, at, at La Scala. Uh, we do know what Puccini eliminated, which was uh, a very large uh, number of, uh, of measures involving Butterfly's relatives, which critics said sounded too close to, uh, to musical comedy like the Mikado. And it, just recently in July, I was at a performance in Brescia where they tried to reconstruct the Brescia thing. And, and there too, they had the same problem. Um, they wanted to make it as accurate as possible, including, I was hoping that they'd show, uh, have the soprano break off her, break off that high note, but they didn't. Um, and in fact, there was a running argument between the director, the, the orchestra director, who wanted to do what they could figure out about the Brescia performance. But the stage director had other ideas. And she wanted to do all the stuff that was in the 1907 version. So it was a real, it was a real horror story. It was a great performance, though. Yeah, David. Do you know any production of the mise en scène or stage production of the Paris production? No, actually, I don't. Okay. Um, they, I, I would be. I mean, since the since the Paris production is basically the form of the opera that became the temporary orchestral score. I would think that a, a lot of that production is also in that score when it's, when it's produced. No, there are things like, um, she has a portrait of Pinkerton on her, her uh, Buddha altar, and she kisses it. This is before the suicide. She kisses it and so on. And I, that's kind of shocking. She still loves the guy. Uh, yeah. That's kind of hard to explain. I just wondered if well, anybody- he, Well, no, she, she deifies him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just wondered if anybody had ever tried to use readings like that from the, that stage, stage manual. I don't know, okay. frankly. Thank you. Um, are there any recordings that do use the shamisen and the buraku? Um, or any uh, 
modern stagings of, of that uh, version of the opera, just because it would be fascinating to hear, uh, you know, what that would give to the opera. And any, any stage, sorry. I'm any stagings with the uh, bunraku and uh, the shamisen music? Um, I don't know. You'd, 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 you'd have to see if the bunraku theater has it. Mm -hmm. um, as a point of information, if they do, you'll find the production fascinating because, of course, th there's no Puccini in it. Mm -hmm. And they, they changed the first act. They reduced it to a 10-minute pantomime of Pinkerton and uh, Butterfly Parting, accompanied by a violinist from a local orchestra playing Auld Lang Syne on a violin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it would be interesting to see. I, mean, I, I suspect, well, I don't know, that's 56. I'm, I, I don't know if they were actually filming their productions then. Um, the, you can write to them. They're very friendly. Um, in contrast to Takarazic, which is very secretive about their stuff, um, they, they claim that they don't have a score. And I think it's wonderful. I, I think it should be revived. It's one of the most intriguing things I've ever come to terms with in my entire scholarly career. Yeah, it sounds really intriguing. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.